Hey class, welcome to today's online lecture on cells and connections. So today what we're going to be talking about is the neuron, the synapse, neurotransmitters, membrane potential, action potentials, as well as some inhibition uh, that occurs as well. So some of this will be review, some of this will be totally brand new to you guys. So just follow along with the slides and we'll have some fun. So the neuron is a nerve cell. It's the smallest component of the nervous system. We have over a billion neurons within our body that communicate with one another. And then we have these glial cells. So a glial cell is a supportive cell in the central nervous system. So it's not a neuron. Okay, it does not conduct electrical impulses. Okay, the glial cells actually surround neurons and provide support for and insulation between them. So glial cells are the most abundant cell types in the central nervous system. We can think of them kind of like um, the Schwann cells on an axon. Uh, uh, you know, when we're talking about communication of a motor neuron to a muscle muscle cell. So they provide glue for matrix, remove damaged neurons, guide the migration of neurons, form blood-brain barrier, and provide nutrition as well as form the myelin. So there's several different types of glial cells in the brain. Uh, there's about 80% of glial cells are macroglia, which would be like oligodendrocytes, which are like the Schwann cells that I talked about of the CNS. Um, then there's also Schwann cells and then astrocytes, which are supportive endothelial cells in the blood-brain barrier. As we can see, part of the functions is forming the blood-brain ba barrier. Now we have different types of neurons. We have motor neurons, which are going to be our efferent neurons. They bring impulses from the CNS to muscles in the periphery. Okay. Then we have an alpha motor neuron and a gamma motor neuron. Now, alpha motor neurons innervate the muscle fibers and are responsible for initiating a contraction. Gamma motor neurons are going to innervate our muscle spindles, and we'll talk a little bit about those later on in the semester uh, when we start talking about the motor system. Then we have sensory neurons, which are going to be our afferent neurons. They bring information back to the CNS. Then we have interneurons. Those are connections between two neurons and only occur in the brain and the spinal cord. So the anatomy of the neuron, okay, all the electrical impulses happen one way. Okay, we have dendrites, which are extensions from the cell body that receive impulses from other neurons. Okay, a neuron can have anywhere from zero to a thousand dendrites. Now these dendrites connect to the soma, which is the neuron's cell body. Um, and we have so, and then from there the axon will carry the action potential away from the soma. And we have this principle, the summation principle. Okay, so summation, we're talking about triggering an action potential and causing, we usually think of a muscular contraction or just causing the stimulation of another neuron. Uh, we have to hit a certain threshold. We have to hit a summation, which is, so the summation principle is all of the impulses from the dendrites are summed at the soma. So if the sum is above the neuron's threshold, that other neuron will fire. If the sum is below the neuron's threshold, it will not fire. Again, kind of reiterating the all or none principle. So a little bit more. Uh, some inputs to dendrites are excitatory and some are inhibitory. So because we don't want to be continuously acting on the multitude of messages from sensory neurons, we have inhibitory inner neurons that are strategically placed within the network of connections between neurons. So in this way, the CNS can create an IPSP, which is that inhibitory postsynaptic potential in which the neurotransmitters cause hyperpolarization of the membrane. Okay, and this is going to, this increases the amount of stimulus required for an action potential to occur at the postsynaptic neuron. So this would be an example of this would be uh, our ability to stop from pulling our arm away when given an injection. We have the ability to move our arm if we'd like to, but signals within our brain, we're able to hyperpolarize certain neurons, postsynaptic neurons, and prevent our arm from moving. Now we have these excitatory postsynaptic potentials. And when we're talking about EPSPs and these IPSPs, basically what we're thinking about is, and we'll talk about um, how action potentials occur, but we're basically measuring kind of sodium coming in, potassium going out. So you guys might remember the sodium potassium pump. You might remember depolarization of a muscle cell. So same kind of thing. We're talking about depolarization of a neuron. And so the summation is the balance 
divided by the combination of EPSPs and IPSPs. Again, EPSPs must hit a certain threshold in order to stimulate an action potential. And so you guys can kind of see here that we'll get an EPSP, meaning we'll have some sodium come into uh, that other neuron, and if it's not high enough, then we're not going to have an action potential. So they have to hit a certain threshold in order for an action potential to occur at that postsynaptic neuron. And we have two types of sum summation. Uh, we have temporal summation and we have spatial summation. So a few synapses require only one presynaptic potential to bring the postsynaptic membrane, so the presynaptic action potential to bring the postsynaptic membrane to the critical firing level, and those are your obligatory synapses, meaning one action potential from that presynaptic uh, neuron will cause an action potential at that postsynaptic neuron. Uh, so temporal summation, if we have greater than one AP okay, at the presynaptic neuron, they superimpose and create a larger ESP. EPSP, meaning they kind of uh, will add up together. So it's the process by which consecutive synaptic, synaptic potentials at the same site are added together in the postsynaptic cell, increasing the EPSPs. And there's a longer amount of time to create an action potential at that postsynaptic membrane. Whoop, got a little ahead of myself. Go back to this one. And then when we're looking at spatial summation, uh, we're looking at kind of a longer neuron. So the longer it is, okay, I mean, there's going to be able to have more inputs, and I'll show a picture of that. Um, there's more synapses, and multiple synapses increase the ability to trigger an action potential. So here you can see the communication between two neurons. And then here's kind of how you guys can look at the EPSPs and IPSPs uh, trying to hit a certain potential in, in which we, or hit a certain threshold in which we trigger an action potential. And you can see where they're, uh, the EPSPs and IPSPs are kind of all located along uh, the dendrites. And we have to hit that threshold before we hit that axon hillock, which is going to be right here to trigger that action potential down this axon. So the axon is the extension of the soma, transmits the impulse, okay? A neuron only has one axon, but it may branch as well. Uh, these axons are surrounded by myelin sheath, usually called Schwann cells, um, or the oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. I'm sorry, that's a little bit cut off at the bottom. Uh, then we have these nodes of Ranvier. So these are gaps in the myelin sheath, about one micrometer in length, okay? And... Um, this exposes the neuron to extracellular fluid, and this results in saltatory conduction. So our action potential actually jumps okay, from node to node, doesn't just go straight on through. Um, so the action potential jumps and goes down the axon that way from via the nodes of Ranvier. We could have demyelination, which would be caused by some genetic diseases. I'm not going to try to pronounce that. I had strug I struggled just spelling it. Uh, we also had auto, we have autoimmune diseases, multiple sclerosis, as well as diabetes. Okay, this results in that uh, a lower conduction velocity and reduced distance of travel. Meaning, if the signal decays faster uh, because it's not insulated, that signal might not reach that postsynaptic membrane. And we have the axon terminal, okay, which is the synapse or the connection between the axon of one cell and the dendrite of an adjacent cell. Okay, the connection can be electrical or it could be chemical. So chemical communication between neurons uh, would be the neurotransmitter. So a lot of us think of acetylcholine, okay, would be molecules released by the presynaptic neuron. These binder receptors on dendrites of the postsynaptic cell. So the synapse, okay, consists of the presynaptic membrane, that synaptic cleft in which neurotransmitters will cross, and then the postsynaptic membrane in which they will then bind. We already mentioned obligatory synapses. That would be something like the neuromuscular junction in which one action potential from that presynaptic neuron or the presynaptic membrane will cause okay, an action potential in depolarization, uh, meaning we're going to hit threshold. We're going to get that muscular contraction. Then we have non-obligatory synapses, which is in which a single AP, that's where it's very important for that 
temporal and spatial summation because one single AP might not be enough to induce a postsynaptic action potential. That's a lot more common in the nervous system. So here's a chemical synapse, very similar, like I said, to something that you'd see at the neuromuscular junction. Okay, and then here's an electrical uh, synapse in which these would occur a lot in the brain. We have what's called gap junctions um, in which the elect electrical signal travels straight over the synapse. So chemical is a little bit slower. Unidirectional can increase, decrease the gain of the signal by hyperpolarization or hypopolarization. Um, and it's easier for the nervous system to modify. Electrical is a lot faster, can be uni or bidirectional. Okay, sh usually shorter distances. Some examples of this would be like in our retina, cerebral cortex. Like I said, within our brain, there's usually gap junctions. Gap junctions are associated with that electrical signaling. So types of neurotransmitters, okay, most are derived from one amino acid or proteins. We have acetylcholine, is not an amino acid, okay, uh, used by motor neurons in the spinal cord, used at the neuromuscular junction. Then we have catecholamines, okay, which are derived from an amino acid, like dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, um, as well as serotonin, which is derived from tryptophan. So dopamine, neurotransmitter in the brain, okay, Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease, uh, results in a reduction in dopamine, which affects motor control at the level of the brain. And we'll talk more about this um, in another lecture. Now we have gamma aminobutyric acid. Okay, we'll just call it GABA. All right, it's a CNS neurotransmitter. Okay, this is an important class of inhibitory interneurons in the spinal cord. Those use GABA neurotransmitters. So this would be something like a muscle spindle in which you know, we get that stretch reflex, which causes, if we hit our patellar tendon, we get that stretch reflex, right? But we also get that inhibition of the hamstrings because we don't want that antagonistic muscle to contract. So a little bit about kind of, we're going to move into talking about how the cell depolarizes, so on and so forth. And so we have the cell membrane, which separates the internal cell contents from external environment has solvents, electrolytes, ions, non-electrolytes, um, which don't have an electrical charge. The lipid layers that are impermeable pretty much to most particles. And then most sub substances require channels to move in and out of the cell. And we're going to talk about all of those. So the ions, fragments and molecules that have an electrical charge, we can think of these as sodium, potassium, as well as chloride. So there's movement along electrical currents. So ion channels move in and out of the cell through channels or pumps, okay? Changing the electrical potential of the membrane causes ions to move in and out. So when we, we can either make the potential or the charge within the cell either more negative or positive by moving cells into and out of the cell. And we'll, you guys can kind of think of the sodium-potassium pump. And the ion movement is based off of two factors. Diffusion, the movement of ions from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And I know this is kind of bringing back some you know, PTSD of maybe chemistry for some of you guys. Um, we're not going to focus too much on the chemistry aspect of it, but I just want to give you guys a review of kind of how our ions move um, in and out of the cell. And then they move with respect to an electrical field. So the total electrical chemical force acting on ion is that Fc and Fe. Uh, to manage equilibrium potential, in which there's no net movement of the ions to the membrane, there's this NERST equation. Okay, so the voltage equilibrium equals the voltage in minus the voltage out. And that has to do with the gas constant, temperature, concentration, valence of the electrons, as well as the Faraday constant, which is the magnitude of electrical charge per mole of electrons. And that's all we're going to go into about that. So let's jump into resting membrane potential. So at rest, okay, sodium potassium channels are closed. Sodium potassium pumps create an imbalance of Na plus and K plus. So they move three Na ions out of the cell for out of the cell for every two potassium ions moved into the cell. Creates a negative charge inside the cell, um, creates an imbalance. So when channels open, sodium will now flow in potassium will move out to equalize the concentration. So resting membrane potential, I said resting membrane potential is going to be negative inside the cell, meaning more positive outside of the cell. Uh, 
so it's approximately negative 70 millivolts, can vary between neurons, can vary based on circadian cycle.